Okay, so we've got one or two last classes. We've already yeah. talked about what powers the vast majority of rockets, but there are a few rather specialist rocket fuels right. that are sometimes used. And the fundamental problem here is that uh, the best rocket fuels are ones that you have to cryogenically load, yes. which is fine for takeoff. It's fine to send you on your way to Mars, for example. But, but you're not going to have cryogenically cool tanks sitting for you conveniently on Mars. Because it might take six months or a year to get there, and it'll all boil off when it's just been sitting in space for that time unless you build in a refrigeration unit to keep it at cryogenic temperatures, which is really not feasible. Because that's more weight, that's more mass you're going to have to carry. Or if you've got a satellite in geostationary orbit, you're going to need to nudge it every now and then to keep it in the exact right. orbit because of the perturbations of the Earth's bulge and the Moon. And so you're going to need a tank of fuel that can stay up there for 10, 20 yep. years, just give an occasional little nudge of fuel. Now solid rocket boosters could be used because they can certainly survive in space. The trouble is they only fire for a given amount, you can't throttle them. And you might want to be able to use slightly course correct to make sure you're right on That's target right. to hit the right part in Mars's atmosphere. Solid rocket booster would be good for a, you want a big delta V, but they're, it's, they're not good for fine for control. finesse. And you're going to need finesse if you're going to aero break or, right. or nudge your spacecraft into orbit. So we need something that's capable of being stored without yep. cryogenic temperatures, preferably something nice and easy and convenient. We're probably not going to use it to do huge delta Vs. No. It's just for the slight nudging and fine correction. But that's okay. Yep. So one possibility would be to use both a liquid fuel yep. and a liquid oxidizer. Okay. So you combine your oxygen with something else. Yep. Um, and one possi possibility is what are called hypergolic fuels. Okay. Now, hypergolic is a nice property a fuel can have, which is the way you squirt the fuel and the oxidizer together, they like, catch light by themselves. Ah, uh, so you don't need to actually ignite them separately as yeah. you do with the hydrogen. Because most rockets, they need to have some ignition system, which we'll talk about later, which is often something that goes wrong and is complicated. Um, in fact, what they often use, like for example the Falcon 9 uses, is they squirt some hypergolic fuel yes. in first to light it up, and th which then ignites the other fuel, the uh, uh, rocket fuel and the... Yeah the oxygen. So things like the most common is probably UDMH, unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine, plus an oxidizer like nitrogen tetroxide. Yep. So a huge amount of research was done over many years with many highly toxic chemicals for this, uh, because this is what a lot of ballistic missiles were used, yes. and especially the Russian ones in the early days used these things, because again it had to be something that could be stored in a bunker for a large period of time. That's right, again, ready to go when you need them instead of preparing. Nowadays most of these ballistic missiles use the solid fuels, because yes. it's a lot safer. But anyway, these were used, and they do have the benefit they ignite on contact. And as you said, they don't need to be cooled, uh, they're stored easily because your tanks don't need to be cooled, so you're not worrying about being brittle and everything like that. And the, the emission uh, exhaust velocity is not bad, 2.7 I mean, kilometers per second. Slightly more better, than... Better than solid fuel, not quite right. as good as the uh, other ones, but uh, not bad. Uh, trouble. Yes. These are corrosive, toxic, carcinogenic, by God they're nasty. Th th these are the sorts of things that when you talk about, if you ever find a spacecraft to touch it, no. Because unless you know it doesn't have this, you don't want to be near it. Because at the end of the day, it is a one of the nastiest substances you can come into contact with. Now these were used by the Russian proton rockets, yes. which for many years were the absolute workhorse of going to space. And these That's are right. basically adapted ballistic missiles. Yes. And because they're adapted ballistic missiles, they used these hypergolic That's fuels, right. which meant there's a lot of toxic waste at the uh, Kazakhstan launch sites. Yes. And, uh, a lot of people were probably, though I'm sure the Russians will never admit this, with cancer induced yes. or horrible burns and scalding and things worse. like this, yeah. and much worse. So this has been very widely used, but it's probably being mostly phased out these That's days. Right. And there are other technologies which can do better for Things have less improved trouble. over the past 50 years, luckily. Another simplification is what's called a monopropellant. The idea would be this is, I mean, in some sense, uh, solid rocket booster is a monopropellant yes. because you've mixed the oxidizer and the um, fuel. Yep. But you can actually do it in a liquid as well. You can combine the two into a single liquid. This gives you the benefit of controllability. You can yep. turn the dial up and down and fire small or large amounts of it. You can stop it if you need it. But still you only need one tank. That's right. And normally you'll need to set fire to it somehow, either with ignition or usually with a catalyst. Yep. They usually devise chemicals if you fire it past a metal grid with a catalyst on that, will it be enough to ignite it? Now, hydrazine is the most common of these. We'll talk about hydrazine thrusters. Yes. Um, and for a lot of time, a lot of researchers and chemists in the 50s and 60s and 70s were trying to come up with a really good monopropellant because it makes the rocket much simpler. That's right. Um, with a high uh, exhaust velocity, 
The trouble is they could get one with a high exhaust velocity, but it would become so unstable that even look at it, it would explode. <laughs> you know, you, your rocket's going to the launch pad and it goes over a bump and bang! Yeah. <laughs> so in the end, they had to go with ones that had a rather lower exhaust velocity, but a bit more stable, so you can actually have some reasonable hope of launching it without it blowing up on the way up. That's right. And, and again, hydrazine, as we talked about before, still isn't that nice of a chemical either. True, but this is now fairly widely used for things like yes. nudging the position of your rocket to keep it in location. Exactly. An example is the Cassini space probe, which has been sending back all these lovely pictures of Saturn, mm -hmm. though it crashed into, it was nosedived into Saturn recently. Yep. Um, and this used normal rockets to give the high delta V to bring it from the Earth to Saturn and to slow it down enough to go into Saturn's orbit. There were probably a few gravity systems en route as well. Uh, I don't know if it did any aero braking or not. Probably on Saturn it's pretty hard. Yeah. Um, but then when it was there, it was in orbit, it wanted to loop past, and, oh, let's go and visit uh, Titan, let's That's go and right. visit this moon, let's go dip between the ring planes. So, so they needed, needed to be able to do small nudges every now and then to, to have a close look at something rather than the other. And it certainly used gravity assist from the moons. That's right. And so they had hydrazine thrusters. And if you look at the round tank on the side, that's a tank of hydrazine. And that what was used to give it a little nudge. Let's go a bit left so we can get a closer look at Titan. The Apertus or yeah. Titan or whatever it might be. And this would have been used to give it its final nudge to send it in towards Saturn. And that's the most common case is using it as a fuel source on board spacecraft to do that little nudging because it gives you just enough, but also can store it for a really long time without co complicating engines and ignition sources. And it's highly toxic, but it's highly toxic out at Saturn where it's not going to kill anyone that exactly. we're aware of.